What is going on ladies and gentlemen? My name is Badmiral and today we're going to be doing a review on an anime beat em up MMO called Soulwork. This game was originally released in Japan in 2016 with the English version published by Gameforge launched in 2018. Now it should be of note that the Gameforge version of Soul Worker no longer exists. It actually shut down earlier this year in April. However, a global version was released on May 13, 2021, published by the developers themselves, Lion Game Studios. As such, this review will be using the Lion Game Studios iteration of Soul Worker. At the time of this review, I spent about 50 hours playing the game and I'm going to be giving my honest impressions and feedback about the game in its current state. Without further ado, let's jump into the review. So one of the things you're going to notice a lot, especially if you're starting this game up, is that it does take a while to load. I'm not quite sure whether it's because of the game loading assets or if it's due to the anti-cheat software, but it does take a minute or two to actually boot up. You'll be able to select from two servers once it's started, either the traditional Chinese server of Roska or the global version of Tenebri. Depending on where you are in the world, you can also choose a channel that will give you the best connection during gameplay. So let's talk about character creation. You'll be able to choose from among eight different characters to play in-game, each one possessing their own unique weapon and playstyle. The character base is mostly female and the classes themselves are gender locked. So if you want to play a male character wielding katana, for example, well, you're out of luck. You'll have to pick and choose to play as Chi, the female character that possesses that weapon and skill set. If you're unsure of what to pick, the game does provide a preview of each character's skills, social gestures, voices, and advancements to help you decide on a character. Visually, I think that the concept of each of these characters is well done. They did a really great job making these characters look distinct and unique from one another, as well as aesthetically pleasing. Initial character customization is quite barren though. You are given very few choices in regards to hairstyles, hair and eye colors, as well as initial clothing. If you're looking to personalize your character further and make them unique, well, you're going to have to shell out some money for in-game cosmetics, which we will discuss later on in the review. Once you've finished making your character, you'll be prompted to set a main character that's going to be taking a part in the ranking system as well as receiving the majority of your rewards. The game does provide some form of security with an on-screen secondary password verification, which is admittedly better than nothing. When you start a new game, you'll be given a brief backstory of your character, presented to you via static panels of imagery before being put in the game's tutorial. Each character has their own unique backstory, and I do like how it tries to get you emotionally invested into the character that you'll be playing. However, during my first playthrough, I found that the megaphone announcements that showed up during my story cutscenes were quite intrusive and took away from the experience of it all. The tutorial instance itself was quite straightforward and does a really good job teaching you about the basic mechanics of combat. I really appreciate that there's also an option to skip the tutorial, which can save you time when you're playing an alternate character and gives players the option to opt out and get into the main game. The cutscenes that play during the tutorial give you a taste of what's to come, and they, as well as most other cutscenes in the game, were well animated and voice acted. One thing of note though is that there's no option for English voiceovers, so you better be ready to read subtitles as you play through the game. <laughs> While the game's graphics may not look as good as Genshin Impact's, it still looks fantastic for what it tries to present. I really like the anime aesthetic and art style that they are going for here, and it's clear they put a lot of attention into making the environments that you encounter different and unique from one another. Little touches like dogs approaching you in towns, birds flying away as you approach them, and even patrolling soldiers make the world seem vibrant and alive. The animations in this game are plenty, from idle animations, combat animations, and even the pose animations at the end of each dungeon, giving your character some form of personality, and I have to say that the attention to detail and work they put into these is astounding. I generally really liked how your character isn't just some static avatar to control, it actually feels like it's something that is alive, believable, and an entity in the world you find yourself in. The enemies you find in the dungeons are appropriately designed for the environment you find them in, although in the later dungeons you may find a recolored enemy model being used to populate the instance. Sound design is great, there's a large variety of background music that plays during instances and in the open quest hubs, ranging from calming town music to epic instrumentals with choir. Character and enemy attacks sound like they have heft, and voice acting for characters and even NPCs in general are decent and serviceable. Let's briefly touch upon the UI of the game. I really liked how it's quite clean and clutter free for the most part, and I was able to navigate around and find the things I needed during my playthrough with ease. It also lets you know when you received a new item, mail, or have unallocated skill points, which is fantastic. 
One thing I did dislike about the UI though was that the chat doesn't disappear and fade away after people have stopped talking and it takes up almost a quarter of your screen. And this persists during the instances as well. I've tried fiddling around with options in order to try to remove or shrink the chat to a smaller size, but there are limited options given to modify it and I couldn't find a way to change it. When you finish the tutorial, you'll be put into the first of many quest hubs. Each quest hub contains a set of dungeons, which you will have to go through in order to continue the main storyline. You'll be talking to NPCs in the hub to get main and side quests, entering the dungeons to complete said quests, then submitting the complete requests to the NPCs, and getting new ones. You will then rinse and repeat this process. Once you have progressed enough for the main story in one quest hub, and have done all of the dungeons for that chapter of the story, you'll be then sent to the next quest hub to do practically the same thing. The further you get into the story, the more quest hubs get unlocked and eventually raids and group content instances where you will need to be in a party in order to succeed. Each set of dungeons usually contains four instances with which you would have to finish sequentially in order to advance. There's no skipping ahead. Dungeons also have higher difficulty options that you can unlock, which you can run for a better chance of getting materials and gear. In addition, entering a dungeon also costs fatigue points, which reset on a daily basis. However, I have yet to reach a point in the game where I was forced to wait for the daily reset as the level up rewards do give you an ample amount of stamina potions to recover fatigue points in order to continue playing the game indefinitely. There's an option to play with up to 4 players in regular dungeons and up to 8 players in late game raids. An Autism Team function exists in the game, which will put you in a matching queue for an instance, although it is rarely used as people opt to just create parties using the team search menu instead. For the majority of my playthrough, it had been a mostly solo experience. I was able to finish all the dungeons up until late game with relative ease and I never really needed to find a party in order to complete any of the main story content. However, the difficulty does spike later on in the game, in the level 60 plus dungeons, as mobs begin to turn into damaged sponges that hit like literal trucks. Even then, the content was still manageable, but I had to be more cautious and less reckless in my gameplay. The gameplay also does tend to be quite repetitive, and at times I found myself losing motivation to level, spurred on only by the promise of new story content and skills to acquire. There's also very little variation in the quests in the game, the story quests involving mostly speaking to NPCs and going in and clearing a dungeon. Side quests range from fetch quests involving killing mobs, entering dungeons at higher difficulties, or clearing a dungeon multiple times. Some content is also locked behind these side quests. Thankfully, they are indicated with a different colored quest marker to differentiate them from normal side quests. So as you're diving into these dungeons and coming out, you'll be constantly managing your inventory to the point of it being appropriately called Inventory Hell. The game initially gives such a small amount of inventory slots that you will be frequently clearing it out to make space for more items. The game does give you free inventory expansion items through the main story quests, but even after the fact, you will be managing your inventory constantly throughout your playthrough. I should also mention that there's a lot of item bloat. You'll have so many items in your inventory, then you know what to do with. There's a lot of equipment and materials that drop in dungeons that you will most likely never equip or use to craft something with, and you will most likely end up selling and dismantling them to make space for items that do actually matter. This is further made worse by the fact that the game is quite generous in its rewards for new players and leveling up. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a great idea to help people out and give them incentives for leveling to get to late game as soon as possible, but the way it is set up now currently invalidates any sort of drive for crafting anything but late game items, and grinding out dungeons in order to get better equipment earlier on is usually not worth it. Every 5 levels you'll be getting a level up reward that will grant you the next tier of unique armor and weapons, as well as potions, resurrectors, brooches, record cards, and more. The fact that these care packages already give you the best possible set for dungeon tear means that you can just ignore the higher dif dungeon difficulties to grind out these sets yourself and focus on completing the main story questline to get to where everyone else is at with relative ease. Now as for the combat gameplay itself, it's absolutely fantastic. If you've played games like Dynasty Warriors or Dungeon Fighter Online, you'll fit right in here. Your character will be entering dungeon instances to complete quests where you'll be hacking and slashing your way through waves of enemies. The combat is quite fluid, you'll be able to weave in your skills between basic attacks, dodging and staggering enemies, and even have a powered up form where you can deal more damage and activate special skills. The skills themselves are flashy, attention grabbing, and make you feel powerful when you use them. Enemies also have their own attack patterns, and mechanics for stronger enemies are usually shown with a ground indicator or a long windup, giving you time to dodge or use an iframe skill to dodge those attacks. If you do die during an instance, you can use a daily respawn token or a resurrector item to get back into most fights, with raids and group content having limited respawns. Every time you level up, you will be given skill points that you will be able to spend to unlock or increase the level of a character's active 
and passive skills. The skill system that they have in place is quite unique in which you can tailor your gameplay depending on your playstyle. Some skills when max can branch off into soul plus versions of those skills, which can change how the skill operates during combat. Choosing one branch over the other locks the other branch out, so you won't be able to use the other version alongside the one you chose. Hovering over a skill gives you a preview of what that skill looks like, as well as its damage and any additional information that you may need in order to make an informed decision. Skills can also be chained together, which can grant additional bonuses to the skills later on in a chain when used together. But what if you make a mistake and choose to invest in the wrong skill or skill branch? Well, the game doesn't allow you to reset your skills without the usage of a skill reset pass, which you can purchase from the premium shop for around $11 USD. However, you will be able to obtain a large amount of individual skill reset passes and a full skill tree reset for free just from playing through the game and doing advancements, so keep that in mind before you shell out money to fix your skill tree. Now, as for class advancements in Soul Worker, it is a linear progression. There's no subclasses here. When you finish an advancement quest, you receive a new character portrait as well as gain access to new skills. The first advancement is able to be done at level 57, requiring you to do a somewhat lengthy questline involving talking to a bunch of NPCs and doing a casual raid to gather materials to finish the quests. The second advancement to become a desire worker is much lengthier, requiring you to go through multiple solo instances and raids but provide exceptional bonuses to your character on top of unlocking new skills. And here I do have to make a comment about the second advancement quest. The solo instances here are absolutely brutal and atrocious. They are unfun to play through. The final bosses of these segments can be compared to raid bosses with boatloads of health and one-shot mechanics. While I am all for locking power spikes behind difficult content, I found this to be wholly unnecessary. I would have expected this sort of fights to be present in endgame content like raids, not in these solo instances where I'm probably going to play once through and never touch again. I probably died more than 20 times on a couple of these solo instance bosses, and that's not saying I wasn't trying my hardest to dodge attacks. There's some attacks that are simply unavoidable and require you to activate an iframe skill in order to dodge. On top of dying, this also reduces the durability of your equipment to zero, which in turn reduces your stats and will keep you in that dungeon longer as you are dealing less damage to the enemy. Thankfully, I had managed to stock up on Resurrectors during my playthrough and was able to brute force through these solo instances, but in my opinion, these instances were poorly designed and served nothing more than to be an unnecessary time sink and a waste of resources. As for gearing and equipment, as I mentioned before, you are able to equip armors, accessories, and weapons that can be obtained via dungeons or given through level of rewards. These gears can be further upgraded with materials that can be obtained via dismantling unused gear. Gear can then be further upgraded via equipping soul stones, brooches can be equipped onto costumes, titles can give bonus effects, cards can provide additional active and passive effects, all of which can be acquired in-game via achievements, rewards, or bought through the premium store. A lot of this min-maxing does require additional research on the player's part in order to find out the best combinations to put on gear, but these extensive gearing systems do ensure that if you do really want to become the best of the best, there are multiple ways to go about it and you're going to have to grind for it. The story of Soul Worker follows a typical chosen one anime protagonist thrust into an unforgiving world where demons run rampant. While some of the story is presented in well-crafted cutscenes that pop during instances, the large majority of the story is going to be presented to you via text, visual novel style when you are talking to the main story quest NPCs. Sometimes story voiceovers happen during combat inside of dungeons, which can be annoying because it forces you to split attention between fighting enemies and understanding what's going on, and unless of course if you speak Japanese, you won't be able to understand what is being said unless you read the text on the screen. In addition, it also feels as if you are reading a roughly translated script sometimes, with some grammatical errors and awkward usage of the English vocabulary when reading through the text. One thing I did notice when playing different characters is that the dialogue and interactions change, so one character's story may have slight variations to another, although they will both typically follow the same story path in the end. His story admittedly does contain some usual anime tropes and cliches, but it did keep me engaged and one is one of my main motivations to keep leveling my character to the endgame. Overall, I found the story adequate and better than most other free-to-play MMOs out there. Finally, let's talk about microtransactions. Being a free-to-play MMO, there's gotta be a way that this game makes money, right? Well, one of the biggest sellers in this game is largely the cosmetics and fashion. 
A stark opposite to the initial options that you were given during character setup, there are a multitude of ways for you to personalize your character with costume varieties, hairstyles, eye and skin color changes, and even underwear. You name it, you can make your ideal character as long as you're willing to spend money to do so. The game does provide free costumes in game, but these are nowhere near as nice looking as the ones you can get in the premium shop. In addition, costumes bought from the shop provide already unlocked brooch slots, which you can then apply stat boosting brooches to for additional stats. Admittedly, this does seem a bit pay to win, but I would classify it as more of a pay for convenience. You can make costumes in game with the same amount of unlocked slots, but it'll just take you longer. Other than cosmetics, you can also purchase Akashic cards, brooch packages, anti-destruction devices for upgrading, inventory expansions, furniture for your personal room, you name it and you can find it there. Prices are in my opinion a bit on the expensive side. If you're looking to buy a costume for your character, you will be paying around 20 USD for a full costume package. Furniture for your personal room can run you between 3 to 5 USD per piece. A full skill tree reset will cost a whopping 12 USD. The whole shop poses a question. What do you value more, your time or your money? You can choose to grind it out and accrue these same items over a longer period of time, or you can choose to wail on the spot to get what you need for immediate satisfaction. And now for the final verdict. Is Soul Worker worth a play in 2021? Is this MMO worth your time and attention? In my opinion, yes. While the game does have its fair share of flaws, this game does a lot of things right, like the combat, the replayability, the story, and it'll definitely keep your attention if you choose to invest your time into it. The replay value here is high, there's a lot of things to do in game, you can play alternate characters for a different playstyle and story, there are a myriad of ways for you to continue to min-max your characters in endgame, there's achievements, titles, and rankings to pursue to keep you occupied. Microtransactions are wholly optional and are paid for convenience. A free-to-play player will be able to succeed in this game if they are willing to put effort in. With the game back into the hands of the developers, I think this will have a lot of potential in the future. In fact, there will be a new character coming out later in July this year, and I can't wait to level them up. Overall, I give this game a solid 7 out of 10. If you can get over the grinding gameplay, the inventory hell, and the somewhat awkward storytelling, this is quite easily a great game to pick up to fill your anime MMO itch. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this was informative. If you liked this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this one. I hope to see you again next time.